Welcome to Great Minds with Michael Medved, where we discuss the past, the present, and the future, always with a view to ultimate questions that human beings are bound to confront. And looking to the future, there are lots of people who believe that the greatest threat to the way we live, the most overwhelming power that could destroy our daily life and our national life, frankly, isn't from China and it certainly isn't from Russia and it isn't from global poverty or even global warming. It's from artificial intelligence, computers taking over and destroying all of humanity. Uh, I mean, you've seen some of the science fiction movies and there are more on the way. Is that true? Is there reason that, that human beings can feel that our ultimate competitors are going to be not extraterrestrial creatures, but creatures that we have created in the form of robots and computers? Now, Robert J. Marx, who is a distinguished professor of electrical engineering and uh, computer engineering at Baylor University, uh, is here with us. And Dr. Marx has just ro- launched a um, a terrific new program at Discovery Institute. It's the Walter Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence. And I wanted to talk to him because I was there at the kickoff for the Walter Bradley Center, and it was one of the most stimulating, a provocative, and ultimately satisfying evenings of intellectual interchange that I had ever experienced. And uh, Dr. Marx is an unbelievably prolific public intellectual who was taught for many years at the University of Washington before his position at Baylor, and now his position with the Bradley Center. Uh, Bob, it's great to have you, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay. First of all, let's start from the beginning. Sure. Um, What's a computer? Well, if you went back into the 1930s and 1940s, computers were actually human beings. There was a movie, which you're probably familiar with, called Hidden Figures, uh, Hidden Figures, exactly, where the women used to be called computers. And what they would do is they would follow algorithms and they would work them out on pens with with pencil and paper and actually generate algorithms from a human perspective. Then along came... Okay, no, no wait, yeah. let's back up for a moment. Algorithms is another one of those words. It I is, mean, yes. People talk about it all the time. What's the best way to define an algorithm? I would... I think the best uh, analogy to an algorithm is a recipe. It's Great. actually a Great. step-by-step procedure to, to do something or a step-by-step procedure to accomplish some goal. If I give you directions to my house, I'm giving you an algorithm. Right. So so if you have a recipe for chocolate chip cookies, that's not... The the recipe hasn't created the chocolate chip cookies. No. It tells you how to create the chocolate chip cookies. Is that... Well, that's true for for the recipe, but I think for... um, (laughs) If, if we talk about algorithms on a computer, actually the end product is not chocolate chip cookies, but maybe the display on your screen or the control of some item or, or some, some such thing. Okay. So the, um, the computers, the relationship between a computer, which as you say used to be uh, defined as a person, yes. and an algorithm is what? Well, actually they're used synonymously. All computer... Um, if you if something is computational, then it's algorithmic. Mm-hmm. People write code, and that code actually goes through different steps in actually accomplishing the in desire of the uh, of the programmer. Okay. And so er- er- everything that you saw on a computer has code associated with it, and indeed is algorithmic. In fact, sometimes they're used synonymously. Okay. So we we've gotten to the point where at one point human beings were referred to as computers. Right. They would compute things. So how did computers, as we understand them, begin? Well, um, it actually started with the work of probably Alan Turing. Now, before that, there were mechanical calculators that people generated, but Turing was actually able to capture the idea of something called a, um, a general uh, Turing machine, which was a machine that you could actually program. He did this in the 1930s with pencil and paper. And it wasn't until years later that we were actually able to implement them. And when you talk about a general Turing machine, what what was breakthrough about that? It was, again, the big breakthrough was that you could actually program it. The interesting thing, even today, the computers that we have, 
uh, are really powerful, they're really fast, but they can only do algorithms that could also be done by the Turing machine. Now, they can do them a million or billion times as faster, but they're still constrained to algorithmic sort of uh, steps. And uh, so, so we have a lot of things which are bigger and faster. However, if you go back to the original Turing machine and look at the limitations of the Turing machine, that's also applicable today. Computer science has a name for it. It's called the Church Turing Thesis, which is the idea that computers today are really no better than the Turing machine of, uh, of the past. So why can they do better. so much more? You, well, you can do it a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. That's the basic idea. And, of course, that's advantageous when you want to do things in real time or, or you want to uh, get results much, much quicker. Okay, I, I think what, what I'm getting here, and I got this the other night, too, with the uh, outstanding presentation at the beginning of the Bradley Center, the launch of the Bradley Center, is the point being that what computers can do is uh, to have a different way of putting together what you put into them. But it's, it's not as if the computer can create something ex nihilo, out of nothing. Exactly. It, there's the old phrase, garbage in, garbage out, of course, but the computer, uh, and this is, this is argued today, but the computer cannot, for example, be creative. Mm -hmm. You can't get something out of it which the programmer did not put into it. What, what about those stories that we've seen about computers composing music or writing plays? I, I remember when I was a kid, they used to talk about how many monkeys working on how many different typewriters at random would it take to com compose uh, Shakespeare's plays. And the yes. idea is I, they figured out monkeys simply couldn't do it, and no matter how many you had. I've also heard that that's been proved today by the Internet. <laughs> so, <laughs> a lot of, lot of monkeys. By, by the way, are we allowed to say monkeys? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, okay, so back to this, this idea, uh, can computers be creative. What about computers That's writing poetry, question. writing music, well, writing I, plays? I'll give you an example of artificial intelligence composing music. The typical procedure is to give the artificial intelligence a number of compositions by somebody, say, for example, Bach. Mm -hmm. And then it will learn the patterns and the rhythms and the harmonies of Bach. And then guess what it generates? It generates something that sounds like Bach. Mm -hmm. But no place will it generate anything like the music of a Richard Wagner. Mm -hmm. or, or, so it doesn't have that creative sort of aspect. What, what's, what's the distinction? Why, why Bach and not, and not Wagner? Is it because Bach is following more predictable rules? No, I that... think you could actually go and if you spent time um, training a computer on Wagner, it would spit out stuff that sounds like Wagner. The mm -hmm. point is, is that it doesn't have the ability to be creative above and beyond what it's programmed to do. Okay, which is a, a very, very fundamental course. Why is that important on this question about uh, the forthcoming battle that people are expecting between humans and machines? Well, one of the things that uh, it kind of introduces the inability, for example, us, for us to download ourselves digitally. And um, indeed, if we can do non-algorithmic things, we talked about algorithms, uh, creativity and some of these other things are actually non-algorithmic. In other words, there exists no step-by-step -step procedure to do these things. This is something that's actually taught to undergraduate computer science engineers. Mm -hmm. They're taught about non-algorithmic things. So we so, know... So, wait, an algorithmic thing is a recipe. A recipe. Following a recipe. Yes. Ba basically fulfilling a recipe. Is there a general definition for a non-algorithmic thing? What would be a good example? Well, the one that's uh, taught in to, to undergraduate computer science is the so-called Turing halting problem. That it is named after Alan Turing also. Mm -hmm. The idea is you cannot write a program to analyze another program to say whether that program will run forever or it will stop at some time. It has been proven to be impossible to write an algorithm, a step-by-step -step procedure for doing that. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's lots of other non-algorithmic sort of phenomenon that exist in computer science. Some things that you can actually define very well, but you can prove that you have the inability to write an algorithm to do that. Okay. We're, we're talking about uh, areas that are limitations on what computers can do. Can computers, and largely you, you raised the issue before of creativity. Yes. And... Uh, 
what can computers, if anything, actually create? I don't believe that they have the ability. First of all, have to define creativity. Can they? They can synthesize. They they can they... synthesize. Yes, exactly. Uh, back in the '60s, people recognized that during the first phase of artificial intelligence, and there's been three phases since 1960s, but they actually recognized that a computer cannot create because creativity normally involves thinking outside of the status quo. In fact, abandoning previous ideas and going if you will, thinking outside of the box, outside of previous ideas and actually creating something new. And computers don't have the ability to do that. If, if you will, they have the ability to interpolate, but not to actually extrapolate. You know, I was just thinking of this. Uh, you mentioned it. You said thinking outside of the box. Uh, do, I, do you know what the derivation of that terminology is? Because computers are boxes, right? Well, no, what, what it is is actually... I, I do know the origin of that. There's nine points that you draw, and I think the question is to draw uh, three lines that go through all nine points, mm -hmm. and you can sit there and try it a bunch of ways. And the only way that you can actually do it is actually extend the line outside of the box to get the solution. So I think that's the origin of the phrase. Okay, this is if you're connecting with a box with uh, in in three dimensions. Well, no, it, no, it's it's just nine points. Right. If I remember correctly, it's nine points, and then the question is, can you connect all of those nine points with three line segments? Uh -huh. And in order to connect all of those nine points with three line segments, what you have to do is actually go outside of the box and then come back in with another line segment. Okay. What what about and there have been so many well-publicized things about Watson playing chess. Oh, I remember sure. that. And Watson, uh, well, Bobby Fischer is no longer with us, so it's no big deal beating him. But um, but Watson can uh, can can beat anyone playing chess, right? Sure. And, this, and go ahead. Go, no, no. And 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 how is that? Does that not involve creative, or is that problem solving? Problem solving computers are good at. Well, first of all, it's a very narrow focus of AI. Uh -huh. Number two. Computers are very good at solving board games, mm -hmm. okay? And that's what it is, uh, both with, oh, I think the big the big three is winning at Jeopardy, which is Watson, and then Kasparov with, uh, with, with chess, chess, yeah, and then AlphaGo most recently with the most difficult of board games, which is Go, uh -huh. at which they, they it did beat the world championships. Yeah, but Jeopardy seems like, well, duh. I mean, obviously wouldn't, I mean, computers, you can program them this whole huge font of information. Exactly. Why is it surprising that they would win a Jeopardy? I, I don't think it is. Uh, there's there's this there's this uh, philosopher named John Searle who came out with an explanation of why computers don't understand. He said that I, if I'm in a if I'm in a room and I have a little Chinese uh, something slipped under the door and I can't read Chinese, if I have a file cabinet, I can go over and I can look in that file cabinet and actually find the translation, copy the translation down and slip it outside the door. Now, the idea is, is that it looks like from the outside that that computer understands Chinese. No, it doesn't. The, mm -hmm. the guy that actually did the translation did not have any understanding of Chinese. And it's the same thing with, uh, with Watson winning a Jeopardy. He didn't have Chinese to English, but he had like all of Wikipedia available to him. Uh, so he had a very big John Searle Chinese room in order to accomplish what he did. So you're exactly right. Okay. It sounds like, Bob Marks, that you're not uh, tremendously worried about uh, a uh, artificial intelligence robotic takeover of human life or civilization. I think that we, we indeed knew, need to be careful. I mm -hmm. think that we can have misprograms. I recently wrote a little uh, blog about 2001, A Space Odyssey, and asking whether HAL 9000 could actually be programmed, or was that something above me on the ability of a program? And my conclusion was, yeah, it could be programmed, and I think it was a programming flaw. Mm -hmm. Because the idea was that they needed to get, the, HAL 9000 thought it was more important to um, accomplish the mission than it was for human life to exist. Mm -hmm. So that was a programming flaw. So yeah, you, you can have things like that. We're going to have that with uh, self-driving cars. When do we have self-driving cars that are safe enough to drive? They become, in that sense, an ethical question. Right. So we are, we are going to have problems, but uh, as far as a, kind of a future dystopia where computers are going to take over everything, no. Uh, that, that I don't believe is going to happen. And and again, uh, I, I know we've, we've spoken um, 
before with Jay Richards, your colleague. Yes. And, uh, and about, you talked about sex robots, and I correct. told Jay that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, is it? I mean, well, I, was, I, I mean, don't know. I think we're doing pretty good. So. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm, no, I wasn't talking about us. I'm talking about sex robots being a hard act to follow. Oh, I mean, because <laughs> yes, cause that's true. The the creep factor is so astonishingly high with some of the demonstrations and some of the conversations they've had so far. When they, when they interview, try to interview some of the robots they're creating. In other words, the one thing that I think troubles everybody, I mean, and even if you thought about it for a moment, is how do you program feelings? And how do you, how do you get a machine to feel? Oh, you can program feelings. One of the great movies was the Spielberg movie AI, mm-hmm. wherein you looked at that little kid, uh, what was the name, Osmond or something, the, the kid that played Yeah, it. Uh, Haley Joel Osmond. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it was so compelling. But the question was, did that robot or that cyborg, whatever you want to call it, did it actually have feelings? And one of the, one of the challenges, well, I don't know if it's a challenge, but one of the things that people do in order to convince people is they use what I refer to as seductive optics. The artificial intelligence has nothing to do with its package. Mm-hmm. Yet if you can package it inside something that looks human, all of a sudden its credibility shoots up by quite a bit. And if you remove that seductive optics, I don't think you would be very excited and very interested in the feelings and such. Okay, we've been a little bit all over the lot. To, okay. to get back to the question we began with, um, what is there that computers cannot do? Well, again, in computer science, there's lots of things we can prove that they can't do. But um, so, so the question is, are there things that humans can do that computers can't do? Now, one of the things we're working on at the Bradley Center is actually maybe tests for this. And I think the most testable is probably creativity. And the question is, is how to form a test where you actually have a test of between creativity and humans. We've done a few of those, but a lot of them are, you know, non-conclusive. And it's going to be hard to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. But there's also the, phys- the um, psychological physiological, not not physiological, what's the word I'm looking for? There's the psychological sort of uh, theological arguments about about it also. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at specifically trying to come up with a definitive test to do that and to illustrate it. And it's like Stephen Hawking said, you never prove anything in science, you accumulate evidence. And so therefore we're attempting to accumulate evidence to to show that's the case. We're going to talk a little bit about um, some more of these issues and the the challenge, for instance, from materialism uh, to uh, computers and the whole idea of artificial intelligence. Uh, Dr. Marks, uh, thank you for the segue for our future podcast, which is actually going to be about artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And thank you for sharing your expertise and your wisdom. Now, people can learn a lot more about the Bradley Center and about uh, Professor Dr. Robert Marks by visiting us at mindswithmedved.com, where I suggest you take a moment to subscribe to this podcast. It's free, but programming like this is not entirely free. There are expenses involved, and that's why I also strongly encourage you, while you're at the website, to consider donating. It's easy. You'll feel great. You'll have that sense of satisfaction that no computer answering this particular solicitation can have. Uh, Go to uh, mindswithmedved.com. That's mindswithmedved.com. And join us next time for continued conversation with Dr. Robert Marks.